All right, so how many of you were here last year for 2017, keeping you on your feet? So a couple of you. Okay, so this, there will be a little bit of review of that uh, particular presentation, just to catch everybody else up in the room. Uh, tonight, it's for Head Over Heels for Balance, um, Subtle Changes Over Time. So we're going to talk about um, some of the indicators, some of the effects, some of the causes and solutions I know that that was a big um, want last year, solutions for change uh, in your balance. So, so what we're going to, our objectives for tonight are to review key terms, uh, statistics. We're going to bring down the statistics and really focus on cost um, of falls um, nationally in, in Alaska. We're going to talk about the balance systems and how they can be affected by different um, issues. We're going to identify possible causes of balance dysfunction, recognize indicators of balance dysfunction, establish solutions for improving balance and decreasing fall risk, and then develop consistent healthy practices or help you develop a plan for consistent healthy practices to help you um, stay on your feet. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about what balance is, and real briefly talk about the cost of declining balance go over a few key terms, uh, look at some overview systems, and then what does it mean to have a coordinated balance system. So what is balance? Balance is the ability to stay on your feet, right? Um, with perturbations or forces reacting on you, whether that's from somebody bumping into you, um, changes in your surface, it's the ability to keep your over your base of support. Okay, so here are the cost of declining balance. So nationally, uh, we're looking for a single fall, for a person who enters the hospital for a single fall, we're looking at $30,000. And again, this is in the lower 48, okay? Uh, in 2015, and this is the most recent um, updated statistic that we have on this, totaled more than $50 billion. That's quite, quite a cost for for falls. In Alaska, the average medical cost for a single fall related incident is 55000 And then in 2013, and again, uh, this is both public and private, most recent information that we have, it's $41 million. Um, so those are pretty staggering statistics when you think about it. When we look at um, why is Alaska, go back one, why is Alaska more expensive than lower 48? We know it takes a little bit more um, for the hospitals to provide care, to keep heating and other um, things going there. All right. So some key terms to think about. Center of gravity, okay? And you may know these, so this is preaching to the choir. Center of gravity is um, direct line up from your base of support. Typically, for the average person, it's about the second sacral vertebrae. Okay, right here, or 55% of your height, right about here, okay? Um, base of support, it's where your feet are in contact with the floor, or your bottom, or what you're using, your assisted device. Um, base of support can change from a narrow base of support, can change from the surface, let's pretend you're walking on a balance beam or a tightrope, to something larger, like the floor can change by simply widening out your stance. So you may find as you age, uh, stance gets a little bit wider. You add basic support by using an assistive device. So that's what that is. Static balance is quiet standing. Static balance is sitting um, or standing without movement. Okay, dynamic balance is when our center of gravity starts going outside of the basic support. So we're starting to reach we're starting to do things um, more actively. Proprioception is where we are in space, where our body is in space, okay? This is a pretty general uh, term, but it really has to do with how your proprioceptors, your receptors in your body, and your exterior receptors, okay? That just means receptors that are talking to your brain need feedback and, you know, they have this conversation going how they're being affected by your environment, whether it's internally or externally, okay? Anticipatory control. Um, if you know 
that Cheryl's going to come over here and bump me. I'm going to prepare for it. That's your anticipatory control. You're, you're setting up for the actual bump, OK? Reactive is a split second thing. It's what your body just does, OK? Later on, we're going to talk about stepping strategies. When your center of gravity goes outside your base of support, and you have to take that step to stay in control. OK, so that would be a reactive control. And then standard functional assessment, we're going to, Cheryl's going to talk about that a little bit more later as we talk about our balance screening. Um, it's just typical assessments that you may find a physical therapist do to help us um, figure out where we're going to go with your treatment plan. Okay. So looking at um, last year we covered the vision, vestibular, and sensory. So this is the, the review real quick. So our vision. If we have blurry vision or if we're, how about if we're walking in a dark alley? You know, that's, if you have any issues with inner ear, um, that can affect your balance. You can lose it very quickly. If you have what we call VOR, that's your vestibular ocular reflex. And I talked extensively a little bit about that last year. And it's basically, <clears throat> it's how your head is, your eye stabilizes on an object, and as you move, like you're in a car and you're driving, and you're able to stabilize and hold an object as you go, have you ever had the sensory when you're sitting there and you feel all of a sudden the car beside you is moving and you're thinking you're moving? Okay, well, that was a play on your system. All right? <clears throat> that, uh, Mike, closer? closer? Okay, yeah, thank you. Better. Okay. Usually I'm a loud speaker, so <laughs> I don't want to be yelling in your ear, but okay, I will do that. Thank you. Um, anyway, so our vestibular ocular motor is how our eyes um, tell our brain w where we're moving in space. Vestibular also gives us angulation, so we have these three canals. Um, an example would be like spinning. Have, you, have any of you guys ever experienced laying in bed and all of a sudden you roll over and you feel like you're going to roll out of the bed? Okay, so some, that's called benign positional uh, vertigo, proximal vertigo. What happens is you have these little crystals in your ear and as we get older, they, um, they can shift out of their placement and it really, it makes you feel like you are spinning all over the world. It is very horrible sensation. Uh, a lot of people, um, so we treat that. The other thing is somatosensory is just looking at how your muscles and your brain interact. Like Heidi was talking about proprioception. Uh, you have a lot of receptors throughout your ankles, knees, hips, all the way throughout your shoulders, up to your neck. And how that interaction, if you have a decreased sense in range of motion or if you have weakness kicking in, that relay system is not going to be working as effectively to the brain. So it's like if you're trying to step up to a curb and all of a sudden you just can't quite get up there or stairs, then that's a good indication that, okay, your body's not talking very well <clears throat> with each other. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so now we're going to look at coordinated. So if everything's working beautifully, we want to see sensory input, how the world talks to you and what, how you, what your body picks up. And then with that should have an integration and then you have a motor input. So like what Heidi was saying about someone if you're walking down a mall and someone walks into you, all of a sudden you have that reaction. So you got your vestibular system working with your visual and your proprioception. They're all three working together. They're picking up all this information, their afferent information coming through. Your brain has to integrate it. So from your cerebellum, coordinates and regulates, and that works with your posture and movement. And then you have your, your intellectuals, your cerebral cortex, and that's your level of thinking and memory. And then your brain stem also is an integrator, sure, integrator as well as um, it sorts out all the sensory information. So those all three have to work together to create what we call a vestibular ocular reflex, which is I was talking about how your eyes <clears throat> are working um, with the motion that's going on. We want gaze stabilization. 
Um, then your motor impulses that uh, work with controlling your eye movements. And then as well, you have motor impulses that uh, make all your postural changes. So it's pretty, as you can see, it's not just, you know, when someone says, okay, I have poor balance, it's not that simple just to say, well, just do this. You have to look at all three components and see how well everything is integrating with one another to re really determine what is a good program for you. So it's not, a lot of people will ask, well, what can you tell me to do real quick? Well, we have to, we have to figure it out. We have to figure out what is your deficit, what's not working in order to achieve good balance. So age, we all know age, right? I hate to say the word age, but our, mo our you know, we just start losing strength. We start losing range of motion. Medications, I'm sure you guys have heard, or if you haven't heard, if you're on five or more medications, you need to really make sure you have good interactions with your pharmacist as well as your physician. Because how those interactions, especially your cardio, if you're having any kind of blood pressure medication, all of that has an input or impact on you. And that can create a dizziness as well. So meds are number one things that we're always checking out to make sure that's not your cause and effect. Disease processes, as you know, um, diabetes, neuropathy. Um, neuropathy is your loose sensation on the bottom of your feet. Uh, you're not having that good sensory input coming through the floor to tell your brain where you are, so that's a big factor. Uh, traumatic brain injury, you know, a fall, if you hit your head, that's a traumatic brain injury. Concussion, all of those has huge impact or can have impact on your body. And it can be very subtle. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk a little bit about cervicogenic dizziness. I think a lot of people get that confused and, or they're just not even aware that they may have it. And so I'll kind of share a little bit more with you on that. Um, depression, um, use of an assistive device, or as Heidi had said earlier, lack of. If your pride's not allowing you to use the device that you should be using, and so you're not using, you're using something that's a little bit less providing that assistance. Risk. Uh, pain, how you kind of protect yourself with pain, inactivity. All those changes to the balance systems, like I said before. Okay, so cervicogenic dizziness. <laughs> this is a mouthful. It's a nonspecific sensation of altered orientation in space and disequilibrium originating from abnormal afferent, which is sensory activity from the neck. So with, let's, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so with that, here's a variety of different symptoms that you can be having just coming from your neck. Uh, between dis disequilibrium versus the swimming sensation, which is another one is like a head, your head's floating um, versus, diz versus a dizziness. You can have ataxia. Um, postural imbalances with the neck. So if we're caught, if we're in a motor vehicle accident, for instance, and you have like a whiplash, and then all of a sudden, you know, your neck is tight, and then all of a sudden you can't move very well, and then you're, you're, you're holding yourself in a pretty strained posture. Well, then your body kind of starts feeling like this is normal. And then you forget what really normal is. And then your body's trying to, your neck is not able to effectively report back and forth to the brain where you are in space. And so that can create other um, balance disturbances. Loss of range of motion, like I said, in your neck. It can cause, you can have referred pain down to your shoulders. It can create unsteadiness. Um, it can also cause ringing in your ear, tinnitus. So sometimes, um, you know, you want to look, if you ever get any of that um, ringing, rule it out, <clears throat> especially if it comes in. So awareness is the greatest agent for change. So we're trying to provide you with knowledge. And in that knowledge, we're hoping for you to have more of an awareness. And from that, then you're going to change your living style, right? Be more proactive. So indicators of balance, we're going to look at all these components. We're going to, assess, we're going to look at gait. We're going to look at cognition, reaching, self, efficacy, posture, reactions. So gait. So these are just some questions just to get you thinking. 
You know, if you ever find yourself walking and all of a sudden you just kind of start shifting off to the side. Or have you noticed like, gee, you're walking across the street and you see that flashing light and all of a sudden, okay, oh my, am I going to make it? Are you walking less because of pain? Is pain, you know, limited you? Uh, as I talked about sensation in your feet, are you having um, any issues with, you know, hammer toes can be effective. Uh, um, bunionectomies, that will all affect your feet and your balance. Um, and then as we talked about stepping up a curve. So all of these kind of are indications that, you know, if you can't step up on a curve, well, that tells you you're, you're not strong, like going up the stairs. If it's hard to do or you're having to really hold on to those railings, you know, that's something that you need to be thinking about. Boy, I'm just not. And it, it, have you guys found it to be subtle? I mean, have you guys noticed any of this? Yeah. Right? All of a sudden, a month ago, or even a week ago, I could do this. And now all of a sudden, gee, my knees. You know, I twisted my back. I did something, I twisted my back, and now I can't do the stairs. Or it's all these little things. And every time you injure yourself, you pick up, you do a modification, or what we call, um, what's my word I'm looking for? <laughs> Read my, my mind. Uh, a substitution pattern, substitution pattern, substitution, substitution. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, you, you know, all of a sudden, you, you just start substituting. Next thing you know, you're using the muscles in the wrong way. When you start using a muscle in the wrong way, you start posturing in a different way. And guess what that causes? more pain, because now you've put your body out of its alignment and you're asking these muscles to do a job that they weren't even supposed to do and you've recruited them. And then they're gonna scream at you and then they're gonna talk to you and then they're gonna cause you more pain. So the best, I'm gonna step on my little soapbox for a second. So the fastest results for anybody, if anybody falls, if anybody starts getting some discomfort and it doesn't go away in a couple weeks, you know, to a week, Get in and get therapy, because the faster you take care of your discomfort or pain, the faster you will recover. But if you're stubborn, right, and you're going to muscle it out and you're going to try and, you know, work it out, you wait six months, well, guess what? Our job is going to be retraining you because it takes your brain, everything I talked about, the integration here, once you pick up a bad habit, how many days does it take to get rid of it? 21 days. Yeah, and then some, because guess what? You have to change your whole thinking pattern of how to move correctly. So it's so much easier to just take care of it fast. Get rid of it, come in, and move on in life. Okay, cognition, so that's what I'm talking about. Okay, how many people have walked with friends and as you're walking, next thing you know, you're bumping into each other? <laughs> okay, so that tells you <laughs> either you're really getting into the story you're telling each other or you've got some problems going on. Um, also, what about um, change in mood, depression? Um, if all of a sudden you're just not able to complete a task, like before you could stand um, cooking and all of a sudden you've got to sit and rest for a little bit. You know, that's all showing that, okay, I've got some, some uh, low endurance. <clears throat> uh, go ahead. Reaching. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So here's my question. How many of you have been able to reach in the far back corner of your closet and not fall? Good. Okay. <laughs> and how many? <laughs> okay. And what about uh, placing something in the oven? And not falling backwards or falling forward. Just food for thought. Because again, that's transition, right? If you're not going to have your vision because you're looking to put something in the oven, and now you have to translate your body forward a little bit more. And if those ankles don't have, or those feet don't have the sensory like it used to, you're talking, again, all these subtle changes. Okay. And confidence. Really looking. The number one for us if you have any, if you're lacking confidence in anything, that's a huge red flag. Huge red flag. Make sure, you know, all of a sudden you find yourself not um, enjoying going grocery, you know, going to the grocery store. Especially when it's a crowded time. 
of course, I hate that no matter what, but I, we all <laughs> avoid it like the play. Um, but also, what about, um, are you avoiding tasks? Oh, okay, what's the latest? How many can climb, step, I mean, uh, get onto a stair and reach, I mean, a, a chair and reach for something overhead? Can you all do that? Okay. Well, used to be. <laughs> You could, right? How about climbing up a ladder and reaching kind of off to the side and getting something, huh? Little iffy? Okay. Posture's huge. As I was talking about the cervicogenic, the neck, okay? <clears throat> if you like the recliner, make that your enemy, okay? If you like pe watching people walk, you know, going to the store and watching people walk, you can see somebody who has lived in their recliner because their body will be just like that. I'm not kidding, okay? And I'm not, it's something to be, we lose out as we get older, gravity's pulling on us, we're weaker, we're not using our abdominals as much as we should, and we start using backs or we start using, this is the favorite pose that I see, a, majority of the time. Knees are locked out, resting on those hips here, and then of course the head has to compensate. So what's gonna go? Here you go. So now my head's way forward, all right? But I'm, I'm resting, so all my weight's where? In my heels. So if I'm trying to do something, what's, what do you think's gonna happen? You're gonna be on your butt. So if you have that kind of tendency to say, oh, that, Okay, nesty plunge, anybody remember that? Ad years ago with a pool and yeah. And whoo, falling back. That's what we see a lot of times. So how you, how you hold yourself is huge. Where's your head? If anything, really work hard on getting that head back in good alignment. Because the more forward here and how that plays and it affects your eyes, that has a huge impact on your balance. Reaction time. So if you're finding that you don't want to step over something, or if you enjoy hiking and then you're avoiding kind of getting into the woods a little bit more because of the unlevel surfaces, that's something I would be, you know, that's a flag. Picking up items off the floor or um, just walking, if you have a time constraint, you know, like I said, walking that crosswalk and all of a sudden it's like, oh my, it's, it's gonna, it's flashing, I can't get to the other side fast enough. I think they have lengthened the time a little bit more compared to a few, you know, when I was growing up. But that's still a flag. All right, so solutions to improve balance. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the balance screening. Um, this is my passion, our passion, a group of us passion. We were noticing a lot more falls happening in Alaska, of course Fairbanks with those icy roads in the winter. Unfortunately for us, we're not outside a lot, correct? In the winter months, unless you get to be that snowbird, which I hope one day I get to be, which I doubt. But anyways, um, you know, where you, you're, you're not getting out, you're not getting the exercises. So what we do, this is offered to anybody and everybody as long as they're walking, okay? They have to be ambulatory. And it's 55 and older, and it's free, free. The graciousness of the Foundation Health, the hospital, has allowed us to do this. It's an hour long. It is comprehensive. It covers every system that affects your balance. So we run you through a variety of different tests. We look at your eyes. We look and see how well they move and if they create any symptoms. We look at your, how your inner ears work with your body, with your eyes closed, eyes open. We, we look at single leg aspects. We look at dynamic gait. We look at how you walk. Can you walk with your and turning your head and stay in that straight line? Or do you find yourself kind of veering off as you go, right? So we're gonna, we put you in a lot of different situations to really tease out any deficit that we can find. And then you can take that information to your doctor and then you can go to therapy wherever you want. But at least you have a starting point. You know where, what's going on and you're, you have knowledge. 
So one of the tasks that we do, do you want to do it? <clears throat> so functional reach, we're talking about, which Heidi said go over a lot in more detail, is between your ankles and your hips, you have a uh, range of motion that you can do. It's called limits of stability. And so for reaching forward, what we would do is have, um, you know, reach your arms straight out, okay? So I might just use this as my little measuring. I have a, a yardstick. Um, and I'm going to have Heidi just reach forward, go as far as you can. And what I'm looking for is can she get at least 12, 12 inches, okay? Now that's only one direction. Now, yeah, thank you. So here, again, starting at the starting point, fingertip, and now lean this way, and how far can she go? Oh, ooh, she's trying, <laughs> she's trying. That's about 10 inches. Okay, then we do the other side as well, because you got to compare your right from your left. I got bum knees. <clears throat> oh, boop, 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 boop. And that's a little harder for her. Okay? I'd like to see a little bit more. You should have a little bit more range of motion, but depending on your knees and your hips, flexibilities, there's your, you can have some deficits. Oh, and there's those inches. Um, so here, 30 second uh, sit to stand. What we like to do is... One of the tests is having somebody sit down on the kind of on the edge of the stair, I mean on the chair. They cannot use their arms, okay? And stop watch them for 30 seconds and see how many times can you come up, then go all and you go all the way up. You can't cheat. And down for 30 seconds. And the normative data right here is women, well, we, we started older, so 75 to 79. They can do 10 to 15. You hurrah! If you can only do three, that is no good, which I've had. So again, this is a good indication that you've got some lower extremity weakness kicking in. And so we're gonna address that. I think the rest is yours. It is. All right. All right, so continuing on with solutions, because I know we want solutions for this. Um, so when you get to physical therapy, hopefully, um, some of the things that we're going to do for you is, number one, decide where the deficit lies, right? Whether it's visual, vestibular, sensory motor, um, we'll get that figured out for you. So increasing your sensory organization and selection, improving your gaze stabilization, maybe that's something that needs to be worked on. And again, these are very individualized, so it may not be for everybody, but increasing your safety awareness, um, that's a... That's a pretty big deal. Um, increasing physical activity levels, increasing functional independence. That's what we all want. We all want to be independent. We don't like having our independence taken away. Uh, increasing mobility. Decreasing anxiety and stress. And hopefully, through education that we provide um, and the work that you do and the things that you learn, we can help with that, becoming more competent. Okay. Increasing core and postural mobility and stability, all comes from right here, and improving limits of stability. Okay, so what is a limit of stability? Limits of stability is basically the distance that you can, um, you want to demo this? The distance that you can sway or lean in any direction, um, yep. Distance that you can sway or lean in any direction um, from midline without changing your base of support. Okay, so her base of support, I'm going to put you at about four inches, four inches between your feet or so. Okay, so that's typical when we're talking about um, limits of stability. It's going to look like an inverted cone, and I have a picture here in just a second. In fact, I'll just go there now. Well, maybe I won't. Um, looks like an inverted safety cone, okay? Two-thirds of your body weight are in your upper body. We know that our center of gravity is about at the second vertebrae of your sacrum, okay? Or 55% of your total height. Um, in a normal functioning adult, um, from front, from the most anterior sway, can everybody see Cheryl okay? From the most anterior sway to the most posterior sway should be 
about 10 to 12 degrees, okay? Um, lateral stability will vary depending on the base of support, how wide you have your feet. The wider you have your feet, the more you can probably reach. Um, that, with feet about four inches apart, should be 16 inches, uh, sorry, 16 degrees from side to side. So that's the, the norm, quite a bit, okay? Limits of stability can be affected by the type of surface you are, you're on. Um, it can be affected by your speed of muscle reaction. It can be aspect, uh, affected by strength. Um, and then the range of the lean, range of motion. So here, shoes can also, yep, yep. So here is our picture of what that looks like, that inverted cone, okay, standing, and this is in various situations of, uh, balance, walking, standing, sitting, okay. So solutions, how do we, if we don't have very good limits of stability, how do we, how do we fix it? How do we accomplish better limits of stability? So we look at balance strategies, okay? So we have ankle, hip, and stepping strategies. All right, so. First and foremost, you'll have ankle strategies. And what that means is most of your support or uh, movement comes from your ankles, okay? It is the number one strategy. Typically, this one happens on firm surfaces, okay, with small perturbations. So Cheryl can sway forward and back and side to side, all using ankle, okay? As we age, what happens? As we age, mobility of your ankle, gets very limited. Right, okay. So as your ankle strategies become limited, and that can be because of injury, it can be because you don't move as much, it can be because of weakness, okay. Um, we move up to hip strategies. Typically hip strategies are the next in line to help us not fall over, okay. Um, when the perturbations or the forces on Cheryl become a little bit faster, or harder, she's gonna start using more hip strategies, okay? Her arms might fly out, and we see that a lot. Someone walking on a log. A log, somebody walking on a tightrope, a, tight a log or a balance beam, may, you may see more hip strategies with that. We do see a lot in clinic. <laughs> From Cheryl. <laughs> just kidding. As she's walking out of the office. Anyways, just kidding, okay. So, she actually just did it there, whether you saw it or not. The next level of strategy, okay, to keep us from falling over is that stepping strategy. It's when the perturbations become really fast and hard, okay, and you need to make a step and change your base of support to make sure you don't fall over, okay. Um, we, I think, typically, Try to work a lot on those stepping strategies because that is for someone who doesn't have ankle strategies or hip strategies to, to fall back to, um, they'll go for, for the stepping strategies. And if you're falling back, the last thing you want to do is fall, you want to just step back. So you need to have that reaction time to be able to do that. Okay, so that's one thing that we will work on. Okay. Hip strategies, ankle. You don't even see it, it's great, it's okay. So, so it's so subtle, subtle changes over time. So ankle strategy, hip strategy, and stepping strategy. Those are the pictures. If you didn't like Cheryl's demonstration, which is often way better than pictures. Okay, so more solutions, daily recommended exercise. And I know some people, when I put this up here, they're saying, oh, not exercise. Well, I know, I do too. Um, strength, flexibility, aerobic endurance, and balance, okay? So we're talking about balance, we have to work on our balance. All right, so per the CDC, the American College uh, of Sports Medicine and the American Heart Association, this is your typical recommendation for weekly exercise, okay? So if you look at aerobic conditioning, 150 to 300 minutes, of moderate activity, okay, or exercise. Or you can do 75 to 150 minutes per week. Keep in mind, this is per week. 
a vigorous activity, okay? Or you can do an equivalent mix, okay? Say you wanna do 150 of each, great, all right? So for strengthening, two to three times a week, uh, targeting all the major muscle groups, okay? Legs, back, chest, calves, arms, butts and guts, that kind of thing. Uh, flexibility exercises or uh, training should be done most days or even daily, okay? As we, as we age, and I'm finding it too, I'm 43, 44? I don't remember. Anyways, <laughs> as we age, and I'm, I'm getting there too, I have to do it every day so that I am well enough to be able to work with people. Just the way it is, okay? Um, you want to do, if you're, if you were saying we're stretching a hamstring, you'll want to do that three to five times per hamstring, and you'll want to hold them for at least 10 to 30 seconds, okay? The longer you hold, the less you have to do. The less time you hold, the more you have to do, okay? It kind of evens itself out. It's kind of nice. And then balance training can happen anywhere, anytime, as often as you like, should be often, but please do it safely. Okay, so if you wanna practice your single leg stance, you do it, but have a counter in front of you, have a chair behind you. Anything that you wanna practice at home is great. Okay, any balance training that you wanna practice, but it really should be safe so we don't have to add you into the millions uh, of money that we're spending on falls. Okay, so back to the aerobic piece of this, okay. So again, the internal eye roll, I know everybody was just checking the lights to make sure that they're on, I get it. When I said moderate and vigorous. Okay, so these are our rate of perceived exertion scales. Now, the first one, the Borg scale, uh, rate of perceived exertion, was made up for people who might be taking a beta blocker, who, if you're testing their heart rate, that doesn't really work, okay? It doesn't really work because their heart rate's gonna be Lower, lower, sorry, thank you Cheryl for telling me. Um, heart rate may be lower and you may not be able to do heart rate training. Okay, so rate of perceived exertion is a very reliable um, resource, thank you. Uh, so when we say moderate activity, can be anything you want that makes it feel somewhat hard. It can be gardening, it can be walking your dog, it can be shopping, uh, what other example? Anybody else got one? Climbing stairs. Climbing stairs. Vigorous. That could be vigorous for some people. What is, what's another one? Housework. Housework. Vacuuming. So different, everybody's different. Everybody's very individualized. You'll find that something that's very difficult for you may feel vigorous, maybe in the very hard, uh, very, very hard, and that's your vigorous activity. Okay? You don't want to do that for very long. You want to pull it back into the moderate. Um, typically, when we talk about moderate, you're gonna stay in those, those two yellow zones. The vigorous would be more crossing over to the red, okay? The only difference between these two scales is one is a six to 20, which is kind of weird, okay? The other one is a zero to 10, which makes more sense for people. That one, the modified uh, Borg, was made for people who have um, COPD, uh, for people who have asthma, so if, and people who just don't like six to 20, honestly. <laughs> okay. So you can choose either one you want. It's, am I working somewhat hard? Am I working hard? Is it very, very hard? That's the scale that you're looking at, okay? Okay. Dyspnea, dyspnea um, trouble breathing. So someone who has asthma has trouble breathing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so home safety. All of these fantastic solutions, things that you could think about when you get home and you're seeing all these like red flags everywhere. First thing is remove things that you can trip over, except for pets, we don't wanna do that, okay? My cats are like time bombs, just you know, weaving in and out. Um, you remove things like books or um, clothes, shoes, anything in your walking path, including on stairs, into, into your mudrooms that may cause a tripping hazard, okay? Removing small throw rugs um, or using double-sided tape for that, okay? Having grab bars, if it's necessary, installed into your bathroom, in your tub, next to your toilet. 
using non-slip mats around the house and your kitchen and, your, uh, and any linoleum will work. Uh, and then improved lighting, night lights, um, floor lighting, and do we all remember the clapper? <laughs> Clap on, clap off, yes, okay. And then finally, really, you should, you should get to know your healthcare provider. And I know it's the last thing I set up here, but <clears throat> if you have something major come up, uh, you want to know who your healthcare provider is. I know that changes up here often. I've had three of my favorite healthcare providers just leave. <laughs> Wait. Um, but it's important to know who you're talking to. Let them get to know you, let them get to know your medications, um, and that's a allow them to screen for medical issues. It's important to, even if you're feeling great um, or just trying to tough through something, it's important to go. It's important to be frank with them about falls. I have, I have hopefully, with my patients that I work with, and I've actually had two of them today tell me that they fall. They feel comfortable enough with me to say, hey, I fell, this is how I fell, help, <laughs> right? So talk to them about it. If you are afraid that you're gonna fall, talk to them about it. If you think that you may have a medic, uh, medication that's doing something wonky to you, talk to them about it. So following up with your healthcare provider is a good idea every year, okay? So, <clears throat> yep, keep going. So what we are going to leave you with tonight is a very special dance. These are my parents. Um, let me tell you something about my parents. My dad is 75 years old. My mom is 71. Actually, my dad is gonna turn 76 here soon. Uh, they've been ballroom dancing for 20, some odd years. My dad has very little sensation in his feet and a knee replacement. My mom has two knee replacements and some, some breathing issues, okay? So I'm just gonna play this for you and so you can kinda, I know it's a little blurry. They're very smooth, but they practice. They practice what I preach. And I like to show them off. Did you see the turn? Okay, so I know, it's wonderful. They really are. Um, so what I'll say about this is that what my dad has always told me, he was an orthopedic surgeon, what he always told me is that, you know, you have got to keep moving. You've got to keep moving, you've got to keep moving. You've got to keep your appointments. And this is, I mean, this is research. This is evidence-based. Keep your appointments with your healthcare provider. Do your yearly screenings. Get your vaccinations and keep moving. And hopefully, what's that? And meds. And meds. Did we talk about that? Yes threw that in there. And hopefully with those things and increasing, did I say physical activity? I wanna throw that in there one more time. Balance screening, if you're at all worried that you're having issues uh, with balance in any of your systems, balance screening is a great place to start. And again, with any physical therapist, it does not have to be Cheryl, even though she's super wonderful. <laughs> okay. We have a great crew that works um, with a variety of, of people who have balance issues. So, um, but that's what he told me. And I take that and I run with it. So uh, hopefully you will too. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us here tonight. We had a, a good time and hopefully you got some good information out of this. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Do you promote uh, strength training? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Gotta be strong to do all those six things. Anybody else? A lot of people in the air where they have uh, replacements. Mm -hmm. And does what's the effect of the balance I recommend? Your your replacement doesn't have those acceptors Right, that's true. So so you still do not in the joint. Oh, so the, so the question is, and I'm going to repeat it so that you can say yes or no. Okay. So the question is, do many people who are older get joint replacements, 
right? That's number one. Number two, how does it affect balance if those joint replacements don't have the receptors? Is that, if they don't have the receptors, okay? So you still have, yes, that's true, the new metal does not have the receptors, but you still have receptors surrounding it. And let me tell you, our bodies are these amazing machines that adapt very well. So the surrounding structures, and Cheryl can definitely back me up on this, surrounding structures will pick up the slack for that, okay? Um, you are right. You are right. You have to relearn. A lot of people don't understand that when they get a hip or they get a total knee, your balance, you're, you're not feeling it's not the same as the other side. So you literally have to retrain what those things all cognitive, a lot of cognitive is involved in relearning your balance. As well as if, and depending on how long that you've been walking differently or balancing differently because of pain, I've had patients, what's our longest patient? I, I, years, years and years. I've been dealing with this pain for years and years and I finally got a replacement. Well, you've been walking differently according to the pain for years and years. That takes a lot to, to retrain. So, it's doable though. We see it happen daily. And, and you are, this is different stuff, but yeah. And you have uh, back deterioration of the that the father should be that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what's, okay, so even as we age, that's what I'm saying, you start getting some aches and pains and they become more of a problem, get it taken care of. Get into a therapist, massage therapist, I mean, any, you know, look for some solutions, but try and get your body to reduce that discomfort level, because it can, you know, and, and in that way that just preserves the quality of your life. Really the whole purpose of this, as we age, we want the best quality independent life, correct? And so that's the purpose is, boy, we want to see everybody stay as independent as possible for as long as possible. Anybody else have any questions? What can they do when they go to a surgeon and say, I have a torn this or that or the other thing? And they say, well, I won't operate on you. Second opinion, go somewhere else. I mean, you know, listen to what they're saying. Um, sometimes some doctors will go conservative to say, hey, you know, let's try this route first, make sure it works, or if it doesn't work, then that is more of an indication for him to say justify the surgery. Well, it, in my case, um, what I run into is this, oh no, that's this, I won't do that. Then you, you're going to have to go out, right. And I try a different one, and oh no, that's risky. And I think what they're really saying is, oh, I could get sued. They could get sued. Well, I don't know. I don't know either, but... Is it just that Paradox doesn't have enough surgeon? Or am I just weird? No, I think that's that. True. Well, I'm not going to disclose. I mean, I'm not going to comment on that one. But I think that sometimes for you, though, or for any individual who has an area of weakness, be as strong as possible, right? Work with, get some therapy to maintain as much integrity of the muscles that's surrounding the injured area, first off. It's not going to take away all your pain, but it may help stabilize you a little bit more. And then from then, continue to research for physicians. I just, I have a quick point to make. Um, I was having a lot of trouble with my knees, and um, fortunately, the surgeon here sent me to Anchorage. And um, I wanted just one of them to place, and he said, no, he said, they're both bad, let's do them both. I didn't know you could do them both, but I will be eternally grateful to him for that because I have range of motion with my knees that I don't know of anybody that had one knee replaced and then another knee replaced a year later. I don't know anybody that has as good a range of motion as I have. So you need to really consider all the ins and outs of what's going on, not just what pain you're having at the moment. Mm -hmm. because I was going to have the same problem with the other knee soon. So 
you really need to listen to what they're telling you. And he had me on physical therapy four days after the surgery. And again, you know, for me, the range of motion is extraordinary. But it took a hell of a lot of hard work. So don't think that just because you get something replaced that that's the be all and end all because it's not. It's just starting, isn't it? It is. Mm. Um, it hasn't, it hasn't partly been my own experience to mash things throughout my life, but I'm always surprised when I hear from folks who have all kinds of uh, surgeries, from carpal tunnel uh, surgeries, when they replace them replacements and stuff like that. And there are still doctors that don't recommend physical therapy. They send people off with nothing. And it's my understanding that you guys can't see somebody without a referral from a doctor. And that's really what my question is. Um, so what do you do when you, when, you, when you get one of those docs that So there's a couple different routes you could take. Number one, I always... Uh, Oh, so I thank you very much. So the question was, when you see a physician and you have some surgeries and then this physician does not uh, request therapy for you, you know, they don't, they don't recommend anything, you have to be your number one advocate. So if that's the case, then you need to say, I would like therapy. Would you refer me to physical therapy? You have every right to ask, and I always recommend that to everybody. Um, you know, the surgeons may do a great job, but then they forget that that, that job is great. They fix something, but they, they forget about your pattern of movement before your surgery. And if it's dysfunctional, well, guess what? You're going to go right into that same dysfunctional patterning. Because until you change what goes in here, down to here, wherever, you're right. You'll have issues. You'll, have, you'll pick up those same pains back. So recommend, if the surgeon does not, then everyone usually typically has a family physician. You can request there, from there. So that's why Heidi was saying it's so important to have that relationship with your physician so they know you so well. So if you do want to cross something like that. I we have self-referral here. I'm going to use a You're right. without. You can, um, in, yes, outpatient, um, your, hometown, your private practices, you can do that. <coughs> exactly. <coughs> that was, thank you, Annette. That's my next, that was my next statement. Um, Alaska, we are blessed. Um, hospital will not, uh, outpatient physical therapy with the hospital will not, that we have to have a physician's re uh, referral. There are private owned um, facilities out there. There's multiple, there's quite a few of them um, that can, that have that direct access, but if your insurance, how your insurance dictates, which majority of them follow Medicare, which Medicare requires a referral, it just depends on what type of insurance you have. Yes? How many people do you know that get the daily recommended exercise? Is that what it's like? I'm <laughs> not. <laughs> there are those who are those maniacs that love those exercises. No, there's quite a few. They're, they're those athletes, right? I mean, the ones that just... But we're Go ahead. Okay, so, but, but we're talking. We're also talking about... As a younger person, that's actually a really good question. Depending on your situation, you may think of exercise as, you know, jogging, walking, whatever it is. Um, spinning, because I love it. Um, but for somebody else, that may mean gardening. They may be out in their garden for eight hours a week, 10 hours a week. It depends. And, and again, if you go back to that rate of perceived exertion scale, if for that person, gardening or vacuuming or walking in the store or whatever it is, gets them feeling like, gosh, that was really pretty hard then that is their activity. So it doesn't always mean Crunch. what you, th crunches. <laughs> Strength training doesn't always mean getting into the weight room and doing leg presses or you know bench press. Sometimes it just means sit, getting up out of a chair. Or yoga. Or yoga. Tai There's chi. a lot, the, Tai Chi. Oh, I love Tai Chi. Tai Chi is a great way to practice your balance and flexibility, yoga. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of variation in that. 
and that daily recommendation. So, any other questions? No? All right, well thank you so much from the bottom of Cheryl and my feet, base of support. Um, we really appreciate you coming and, and tolerating us tonight. So <laughs> have a great night.